is uh, we're featuring a lecture on age-related retinal diseases, featuring two of our specialists. You'll hear from Dr. Stephanie Liu on updates on age-related macular degeneration. And she'll be followed by uh, Dr. Henry Clauston, who'll be talking about the research being done on retinal progenitor cells for the treatment of macular degeneration. We will take questions and answers at the end of each lecture, but feel free to post a question in the chat during the lecture or wait till the end and ask a question directly to the speakers. Um, just so you know, and you can see on screen, this lecture is being recorded and once it's been edited, it will be posted on our website. And I'll put the location of our website in the chat just so you have it handy. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephanie Liu. Thank you, Dana. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for attending the session today. So I'm going to go over what is macular degeneration first, and then the importance of stabilized vision, and what are the treatment options for both dry and uh, wet macular degeneration, and what's in the future, what's in the pipeline, what's coming up in the next few years. And first of all, I have no financial disclosure. So we use our eye as a camera. And then you know there's so many different ways for us not to be able to see very clearly. A lot of people say, why don't you just give me a pair of glasses? But it's not that simple, especially for macular diseases. It cannot be fixed with glasses because it's not a refraction problem. It's actually a structural problem. So what is macula? Macula is the center of the retina. Thinking, uh, just think about, like the eyeball, if the wallpaper of the eyeball is the retina and the right in the center, that's the macula. The macula is very small. It's only like about 500 microns, very, very tiny, but ex it's extremely important for our central vision. So as you can see, right in the middle is our central vision. It's controlled by our macula. And then outside of that, are those are peripheral visions. So with patients with a severe macular degeneration, they lose their central vision. However, they usually don't go to, they're not totally blind because of their peripheral vision is still preserved. So a lot of times the contrast sensitivity goes down first before they lose the vision. What is contrast sensitivity? Usually we don't know much about it, but think about it. What's the highest contrast is black, versus white. So when you have a very high contrast, patient with macular degeneration can see pretty well. But once we start to blur down those contrasts and then the vision start to go down, so they don't see as well. As you can see, when they have a decreased contrast sensitivity, everything is in the fog, they can't see. This is a picture with patient, uh, this is a very, very high contrast sensitivity. Uh, so as you can see, everything is so nice and sharp. When we reduce the contrast sensitivity, everything becomes blurry and blurrier to the point they can't see very well. Lighting is extremely crucial in patient with uh, macular degeneration. They need, um, a lot of time patient will say, you know, I can't see you when it's, uh, it's not very bright. And then uh, I need so much light to see better. That's because they have decreased uh, contrast sensitivity. So the lighting will bring up the contrast sensitivity. See, in the low light condition, everything's much more blurrier compared to bright light. And a lot of times the patient will come to the uh, office and then when we ask them to read from the chart, they can see 2020. However, the quality of 2020 is very different from the normal people. In the low light condition, they, they can barely make out those letters. Yes, they can see them, but they're not very clear. So they, even though they're 2020, the quality is very, very poor. And they can have distortion, even though they can make out the F, E, L, O, P, Z, D. However, those letters are distorted. So how do we examine patient's eyes? If you've been to the clinic, you will know we use a device called slit lamp. Slit lamp is a microscope. It can magnify all the structures. So we can see all the small 
uh, tiny vessels in the, the retina, the um, optic nerve very clearly. And then we use imaging devices to take pictures. So this is a wide field imaging uh, from this photo. As you can see, you can see the optic nerve or the vessel coming out of optic nerve. And this is the macula I'm talking about. Look at this, a tiny little region is responsible for 100% of your central vision. Anything outside those big vessels, those are the peripheral visions that you have. Even though area of the retina is so much bigger, So what are the most important structures in the macular region? There are three layers that's extremely important for the macular health. The retina, the foundation of the retina, which is called RPE. So it supplies a nutrient to the retina and the blood supply underneath the RPE, the choroid. So if you ever come to our clinic, a lot of time you will get OCT. So OCT is optical coherence tomography. What it does is very similar to ultrasound. Instead of ultrasound is using a sound wave, OCT uses a light wave to construct a 2D images of your retina. Take a look at here. This is the picture of this retina. And here is the optic nerve. You see a little divot. This divot is called fovea. Fovea is the center of the macula. So what's the difference between dry and the wet macular degeneration? The dry ones, as you can see, the foundation is being damaged. The structural, there's a structural damage to your uh, house. And then when it's wet, that means it's being flooded. So it's leaking, it's bleeding inside the eye. So the foundation maintenance is extremely important. We want to maintain the vision before they go bad. This is a picture of small drusens. Those are very early changes in, in the macula. Those are little tiny yellow dots. So what are they? Those are proteinaceous deposits underneath the retina. So why do we have them? Think about the RPE cells underneath the photoreceptors. Those are the scavenger cells. They get rid of all the waste products in our eyes. And then we only have one set of scavenger cells in our entire life. As all our cells, we get, they get older. So they stop, uh, they start working very slowly and then they can't get rid of all the waste product. Then they start to accumulate. So that's why it's age related. So the young people, they have very good scavenger cells. They don't accumulate those waste product. That's why you don't see it in young patients. And then we only start seeing those drusens if it's age related, it has to be a patient above age 55. As we start to accumulate more drusens, as you can see, now it's become very obvious. Those are intermediate and large fluffy drusens. When we see intermediate and large fluffy drusens in the macula, you have an increased risk to going into wet macular degeneration. So this is the OCT of the normal macula. As you can see, nice little divot. All the RPE cells, photoreceptors are completely straight. Take a look at the patient with like an intermediate um, macular degeneration with all the drusens. There's a distortion of the RPE cells and the photoreceptor. That's why patient has complaining of distortion. So the uh, straight line become distorted. They're not straight, a, it's very bumpy. So this is a picture with a wet macular degeneration. As I mentioned earlier, wet means it's either bleeding or leaking fluid in, uh, within the retinal tissue. As you can see in this picture, there's blood over here and here and here. And then the central macula is thickened. It's kind of yellowish. Once again, compared to the normal OCT, you can see there's subrenal fluid. There's intrarenal fluid over here. And there's some scarring start to form. Patient has very distorted blurred vision. So this is a picture of advanced dry macular degeneration. You can see that this whole area doesn't have normal tissue. The tissue become very atrophic, very thinned out. So the normal renal tissue is gone. What you're seeing is a choroidal tissue, is the choroidal is the tissue underneath the retina. So there's no more retina tissue. So patient has a huge blind spot in the, 
in their central vision. As you can see from here to here, there's complete obliteration of the photoreceptor. They're completely gone. So for the age-related macular degeneration progression, they usually start with a small drusens, like asymptomatic, very mild changes. And then when the drusen become bigger, patient becomes more symptomatic. They start to complain about decreased vision, blurred vision, distorted vision. And then they can go into two stages, in the advanced dry stages, or can convert into the wet stages. So managing the dry macular degeneration. So what can we do? There are certain preventable uh, prevention that we can do, modifiable or unmodifiable. Modifiable is something that we can do to help us, such as stop smoking, control our blood pressure, control the cholesterol, and then control the cardiovascular diseases. The unmodifiable um, risk factors are family history. So if you have family history, of course, you have an increased risk developing macular degeneration and hyperopia, light iris color, and female. So usually the dry macular degeneration is very slowly progressive. A lot of, a lot of patients are completely asymptomatic. As they progress into the wet macular degeneration, what can we do? Currently, the treatment modality is usually the injections. And we have four different medications to choose from, and I will talk about it later. And laser. Laser is not very popular anymore because it does cause a central scotoma and it destroys central vision. So we only do it as a last resort. And it's not the, the thermal laser, we should use a, use a PDT, photodynamic therapy. So as I said, dry macular degeneration is the most prevalent ones. And then usually 80% of mac patients with macular degeneration have dry type. They're very slowly progressive. So majority of those patients don't really have much symptoms. And really they have the, um, progressed to advanced disease with severe vision loss. So everybody heard about eye vitamins. The age related the eye diseases and the high, um, concluded that there's certain vitamins are good for eye health. Things including lutein, zeaxanthin, vitamin C, vitamin E, and zinc. Copper is not really needed. The reason we're using copper is because if you take high dose of zinc, it, uh, you can become anemic. So copper can prevent that. So that's why copper was added to the uh, formulation. So do they really work? Why are we pushing vitamins? Found every study, study will have shown that the risk of um, progressing to advanced macular de degeneration can be reduced by 25% over uh, the five year period. So they do work. However, a lot of patients don't know that when you have a very early mild diseases, there's no benefit by taking the vitamins. So the vitamins is only beneficial for patients with moderate to severe diseases. So, so far, with patients with a severe uh, dry macular degeneration, we don't have any treatment modality. We can only push vitamins for all the patients. However, recently there are two clinical trials going on to try to slow down the progression of geographic atrophy, which is the severe form of dry macular degeneration. As we know, um, inflammation is bad for our macular health. So the complement uh, cascade causes a lot of inflammatory response. So uh, the researchers have studied to, um, for those complement inhibitor to see if, if we inject those inhibitor into patient's eyes, do they slow down the progression of the geographic atrophy? So this study is already in the phase two slash phase three phase. So, um, and the result is pretty impressive. They total have 286 participants uh, with patient, patient with geographic atrophy, secondary to uh, age-related macular degeneration. The outcome measure is by at the baseline, six months and month 12. We use the auto uh, fluorescence photos and to measure out the size of the geographic atrophy over the next 12 months. So a patient received monthly injection in the study group. And then there's a... Um, uh, earlier, the one I mentioned is a, 
uh, complement five inhibitor. There's another complement three inhibitor. It's also in clinical trial. Currently, it's in phase two, and then we are actively uh, recruiting patients in this trial. And then um, that trial is also monthly injections. So um, in the past, we never treated with a macular degen uh, dry macular degeneration with injection, but in the pre previous those two trials, we do inject a patient monthly to see if it, we can slow down the geographic atrophy formation and expansion. So what are the treatment modalities for wet macular degeneration? So everybody knows about injections, you know, like a wet macular degeneration, you go to the doctor's office, you get your shot in the eye. So there are four different medications that we have commercially available for us. And then if everything fails, we can also use a photodynamic uh, therapy to treat a patient. Avastin is the first anti-VEGF came out on the market. Actually, initially it was designed for colon cancer. However, it didn't work very well for colon cancer, but works very well for eye diseases. So about, I would say 16 years ago, um, AL published a study. It was like, it had amazing results to control the uh, wet macular degeneration. Prior to that study, there's nothing that we can do for the wet macular degeneration. We'll just tell the patient, you have fluid in your eyes, you're bleeding, but there's nothing that we can do. But about 16 years ago, finally, we'll have something that we can use to treat macular degeneration. Lucentis is made by same company as Avastin. It's also made by Genetic. So what's the difference between Lucentis and Avastin? Think about it uh, as Luc Avastin as a whole molecule. Lucentis is just cleaved into half. So you have a half of the Avastin molecules. So uh, theoretically, it's smaller. So maybe it can penetrate deeper in the retina, so it work more efficiently. But so far, head-to-head -head studies didn't show the difference. They both work equally well. And ILEA came out two years after Lucentis was in the market. So it worked a little differently. So previously, Avastin and Lucentis, they are monoclonal antibodies against the VEGF. So VEGF is the signal promoting uh, vessel growth. And um, I, uh, Lucentis and Avastin, those are antibody against the uh, signal. So it targets the signal. But ILEA, what it does is doesn't target the signal. It targets the receptor. So the, um, the signal cannot attach the receptor to causing the uh, chemical reaction. So they work the same at the end, but they'll target different uh, endpoint. BioView. It's the newest one coming to came to the market. It came to the market about like a year and a half ago. However, it was not being used widely. In the clinical trial, it worked wonderfully. You know, like some patients being still being wet after despite monthly injection of Avastin or ILEA or Lucentis with BioVio, they dried up beautifully. However, the safety profile is not very good so far with BioVio, so that's why it's not widely being used. Some patients develop severe vein occlusion and causing devastating vision loss. So that's why we're still waiting for the safety profile to improve before we can use it on the patient. So when everything fails, patients still have progressive diseases, what do we do? We can offer them photodynamic treatment. So what it does is we have, and this is a laser treatment, it's a cold laser. What we do is we actually have to set up an IV, have a nurse set up an IV, inject um, the medication through the vein, and then let it circulate through the vessels, and then apply the laser. Um, it works really well in the past for patients with severe disease. However, it does cause macular atrophy over time. So we try to use it as a last resort when all the injection doesn't work, then use it because we don't want a patient to have any uh, collateral damage from the photodynamic therapy. So what do patients with macular degeneration can expect? Please don't lose hope. There's so many new medications coming out on the market uh, recently. And then a lot of clinical trials is a targeting towards the dry macular degeneration. So we're living in a time of innovation. There's so many new things are coming up. For example, stem cell research. And then my colleague, Dr. Clarkson is the world's expert of stem cell research. And then he's gonna talk about how stem cells can help you 
to slow down progression of the ge um, geographic atrophy or potentially tree macular degeneration. So I'm going to turn the podium to Dr. Claussen. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and hello, everybody. So uh, that was a great introduction to AMD. And now we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, we're developing a cell based therapy for retinal photoreceptor degeneration, which of course includes AMD. Um, our initial target is retinitis pigmentosa. And the reason for that is something I'm going to discuss as we get into this. Um, but first, I want to point out my disclosures. I do have a financial and um, patent interest in a company, JSite, which is working towards uh, bringing this to the patients. So here I just want to con uh, contrast uh, AMD, which you just heard about um, and shown in the lower section of the slide, to retinitis pigmentosa that you may or may not have heard of, and that's in the upper. Um, and so first off, um, as you know, AMD is due to aging and it's a common problem. And as you saw so well, that the different layers of the retina can be involved. I think you remember that OCT with all the fluid all over the place and lots of problems in the macula. Um, but the problems, even though they include all layers of the retina, they are localized to the central part of the retina, as you heard. Of course, that's the most important part of the retina, but the saving grace is that the other 90 plus percent of the retina is typically unaffected. In RP, on the other hand, the, the problem is hereditary, it's rare, but that gives us orphan status with the FDA. Um, and it's widespread over the retina. And what people experience is first night vision, then it becomes this contracting tunnel vision. And finally, at the late stages, they go completely blind. Um, so it's an extremely devastating disease. And it typically affects people earlier in life. Now, there's a number of people trying to approach this by gene therapy. Um, but RP, even though it's rare, is composed of many, many different specific mutations. So that presents the conundrum that all the different subtypes of RP need a different genetic treatment. So it becomes kind of ultra orphan um, in terms of treating the different types of RP. And that becomes kind of prohibitive from a financial standpoint. Now, there is this very important commonality, and that's why I introduce RP and AMD together. And that is that the photoreceptors at the back of the retina are the key inflection point in the disease process. It's the loss of these rods and cones uh, that's irreversible and that leads to all the visual complications that are so difficult to treat. And so, if we're not going to do this genetically, um, how could we possibly treat it? Well, from a cell-based standpoint, um, we have the tools to either try to do photoreceptor replacement, literally replace the rods and cones with new cells, or neuroprotection. And I think both of these approaches are potentially viable. Um, we're focused on the second one, neuroprotection. And what we mean by that is, we're trying to rescue, to save the host photoreceptors, the, the cells that are already there in the retina, and not only keep them from dying, but if possible, to resuscitate, to recuperate some function out of these cells um, that the, is useful to the patient. Now, in doing so, it's not necessarily a cure, but it can be a very, very important treatment and depending on how effective it is, you could slow the progress down to the point where the patient's disability is limited. Um, so that's our strategy, neuroprotection. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the rods and the cones independently here. 
and that is because in RP, it's the rod that expresses the mutant gene. So you have this genetic disease, the mutations in the rhodopsin, rhodopsin is specifically expressed by the rods. And so the rods die first. Now the funny part of this, it's not funny, but it's, it's unusual is that you don't really need your rods as a human being. As a human being, we rely mainly on cones. But remember, it's the rods that carry the mutation and the rods that die. Um, so if it just stopped with the rods, all you'd have to do is pick up a flashlight when it's dark and you could function just fine. Now, the problem is that over the course of years, as the rods are all gone, eventually the cones also start to die. Now that's not mandated by the genetics, but it's an epiphenomenon. It's like a knock-on effect. So you could think of the cones as a bystander that gets eventually hit by the, the explosion that's the cones or the rods dying off. Um, when that happens, it's late in the disease, but it starts to impact central vision and it's really devastating because then the patients start to lose their remaining vision. So if, if we can rescue these cones that are not even expressing the mutant gene, then we've actually made huge progress on treating the disease. Because the cones don't have to die, um, we should be able to rescue them even if we don't cure the underlying mutation. That's the rationale. Um, and then what, how to do it. Now we could take different cell types. So we're using tissue specific retinal cells because they are pre-configured to make human retina. And so that's what they do. And so we're gonna move these cells um, into the patient and see if they can do something to, to fix up the situation in the retina. Now in theory, we could work with the cells you see on the left here those are embryonic stem cells, and those are true stem cells, unlike our progenitors. Um, and the advantage there is um, that you can make unlimited supply of cells uh, from these embryonic stem cells um, because um, these cells can multiply indefinitely. The downside is, of course, it's more complicated to go all the way from an early embryonic cell to make a retinal progenitor cell, whereas our method starts with basically the progenitor cell. So we're already in the home stretch. So we've just simplified the task. But I predict in the future, these cells will be generated. You'll make the cells on the right from the cells on the left eventually. This is just some of the animal work, and I don't want to you know, get hung up on this. But this gives you an idea of what we do. The image on the left shows this colorful ball of cells. That would be the transplanted progenitor cells. And up above this arching structure is the retina in the recipient eye. And so the retina is the one that's degenerating. And this ball of cells is going to put out uh, a bunch of molecules that are going to help the photoreceptors in the eye. Um, survive. And so the little ball of cells could be seen as a, a cell, as a drug factory. That's basically how we're using it. And then in the middle, you see a, a rat retina um, that's been taken from a rat that goes blind, that looks a lot like an RP retina. And then in the right hand column, on the upper right, you see. Uh, not very much, and that's because you're looking down at a retina of a degenerated rat, um, and you just don't see much signal, a little bit of red here and there. Um, basically, there's nothing left in terms of photoreceptors. And then in the lower right, you see a lot of red punctate profiles and a lot of green punctate uh, profiles, and those are all individual uh, photoreceptor units that have been preserved by the treatment with the progenitor cells, indicating that this treatment does in fact slow the degeneration and retain a lot more photoreceptors than you would otherwise have at any given 
point in the disease process. And we also have to check that, okay, you have more photoreceptors, but are they working? And we use two different tests here in the animal. One's a behavioral test up top, and the other one's an ERG, which is an electrical recording, kind of like an EKG, but it's from the eye instead of from the heart. Um, in either case, uh, we saw evidence that the treatment uh, has an effect, positive effect on outcome, uh, consistent with improved vision. So going from the animal to the person, what we have here is a product that's based on retinal progenitor cells. They're kind of like a stem cell, but they're a little further down the development path. So they're a bit more mature but they're still immature compared to a normal retina. The source is allogeneic, which means it's a transplant between individuals. So just like a kidney or a liver, um, you have to get it from somebody else. But the beauty of that means we can prepare this ahead of time and we can have frozen samples that are ready to go. We don't have to retrieve them from each patient individually. So that really facilitates things. Um, and then our disease target is RP, but as you'll see, we're, we have bigger plans even than that. Um, and we're gonna deliver this with a needle into the eye, um, which is now a pretty routine because of all the Lucentis treatments that you've heard about that Stephanie talked about. Um, and those injections are done under a topical anesthetic. Those of you who had them know that they put some numbing drops in the eye, and then the injection is over with in a few seconds. So that's a lot less invasive than surgery, which would be the more traditional way to deliver stem cell. Um, interestingly, with, even though these um, cells come from a different individual, they do not require immune suppression. And that's a story in itself, but it really benefits us in terms of making our treatment a lot simpler and less risky for the patient. And then again, these are for neurotrophic purposes. So we're not attempting to replace photoreceptors. We're trying to rescue the cells that are still there. And that'll come in important as we talk about the clinical findings here. So now we're shifting into the actual clinical studies. So our, you know that clinical trials come in a, three flavors, a first one, an intermediate, and then a final. So there's like a phase one, two, and three. Now the nomenclature gets a little more complicated. So our first one was a one slash two A. <laughs> So it kind of combined a few features of one and two, um, but the point is it's the first trial. And the dosing went really well. We had 28 patients and they all finished the trial. And um, there were three different, or let's see, four different dosing levels and everything went really smoothly. And that's because there were no big crises around um, safety related issues. And because we had all our material, all our cells prepared ahead of time. And uh, there was no uh, immune re uh, rejection, even though we did not immunosuppress. So that's really a major uh, vindication. Now, here's the um, visual output from the first trial. Um, and basically what you see are a comparison between the two eyes. So there's the treated eye, we have the solid colors, and there's the fellow eye, which has the kind of faded colors. And so what we're looking for is a treatment effect, which would be taller solid bars and shorter compared, you know, comparatively shorter faded bars. And then the different colors represent the four different treatment groups, the different dose levels. And so we start with the smallest dose on the left, we escalate to the right. 
and you see a general trend um, where maybe there's some indication of treatment effect um, a little bit um, at the lower doses, but we see quite a nice boost as we start going up towards the higher dose. Um, so we see a quite a substantial improvement in vision over the fellow eye. And what's interesting here is that in RP, your main goal is to slow the progression, but in fact, we're actually seeing something of an improvement. Um, so that was very gratifying to us. The FDA encouraged us to keep going and to explore additional dose levels. But before we did that, as our patients completed the first trial at month 12, they were still around. So we continued to follow them. And we also um, gave them the opportunity to have their other eye treated if they so wanted. And almost everybody wanted to um, have their other eye treated. And that went smoothly as well. And again, even though we're treating the other eye, we didn't see any immune rejection. Um, so again, that's we've raised the bar even higher and we're still reassured by the fact that the cells aren't being rejected. Then we get to the phase 2B trial. This is a very important trial because now we're looking at efficacy. This is a mask controlled trial. You're going to have different treatment arms, one of which is the control mock injection. And then we had a 3 million dose and an even higher 6 million dose. And again, we're looking at visual acuity at 12 month time frame. In addition, we started to explore other ways of evaluating a visual function, um, including a mobility test, it's like a maze and visual fields. So not just the central vision, but peripheral vision, and also contrast sensitivity. Dr. Liu mentioned how important that is. And we also had a questionnaire. Uh, people could assess how they're doing. And enrollment for this went pretty well. It's a bigger trial, it was more complicated. There were more centers involved. So it took a little longer than the previous one, um, but it went well and um, it actually is completed. And at the completion of the trial, um, <clears throat> participants who were in the control arm were given the option of converting over to the treatment, which means they were um, allowed to get an injection. And again, that was popular choice. So here's a visual outcome. And again, the safety was fine. Um, so visual outcome, what you see are different treatment conditions. These are the three groups. The control is the dotted line at the bottom. Um, the three million is the gray line. And then the dark blue at the top is the six million dose. And you see this kind of rapid rise in function in the six million that um, gets close to a plateau somewhere around three months and is sustained through the, both the six month and the 12 month time point. So the treatment effect is sustained quite a bit. And this really echoes what the patients report back to us. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing here is you notice that the, um, the, the three million in the, control arm are a little bit tangled up. And that variability there meant that even though we saw this uh, really nice response from the highest dose, that the result fell a little bit short of statistical significance, which of course is really important to us. Um, so we did some analysis in terms of like, where's this variability coming from? And it became really obvious that um, people who had more intact retina before the trial were predisposed to get more return of function during the trial. That means the more photoreceptors you have to rescue, the bigger rescue effect you get. 
And so that was actually pretty logical and shouldn't be too surprising. So um, when we apply that kind of, when we go back to the original patient population and we take out people who had very severely impaired maculas based on clinical exam and OCT, um, then rerun the data, um, we got a very similar result, but with less noise in it. And this time the result was very uh, statistically significant. So long story short, we believe that we understand this population better and our treatment better. And um, we know how to design phase three uh, better. In terms of these other um, outcome measures, again, um, looked at after we've selected out the variability, um, we see kind of prominent responses from the 6 million dose in dark blue again um, throughout these different modalities. So no matter which way you measure vision, we see a similar trend, and that is that the 6 million dose looks like the winner. And the different measures reinforce each other in terms of coming to the same conclusion. Okay, so as we march through these different trials, where we are now is we've completed that phase 2B and we've finished enrollment of a phase 2 redosing study. And what this study is about is we take people who have already had treatment in an eye and then we redose the same eye, not the other one, but the same one. So, um, this is um, raising the safety bar even higher, um, but because we intend to retreat people, because the cells in the vitreous will survive for a long period of time, but not indefinitely, we know we have to retreat people at a year or a couple of years out. Um, and so it's important to demonstrate that we can repeat the dosing in the same eye with, without eliciting problems. And then next up will be phase three. Um, that's the biggie. And that's the one that um, the FDA is particularly interested in. And that's the one they'll use to decide whether the treatment gets approved. Um, so all our efforts now revolve around getting ready for that phase two, uh, phase three, including getting the redose safety data together, including uh, the commercial manufacturing of the cell product, uh, which has to be manufactured now at a much higher standard um, with much more documentation. Um, and uh, also, um, well, those are, those are the main things. So manufacturing and the redos and then preparing the template for organizing phase three trial, of course, the actual plan. Um, and then looking ahead, once we have additional product, the commercial product, once phase three is underway, uh, we can turn our attention to other indications. And of course, AMD is at the top of the list and Work in the lab has also indicated that additional um, retinal diseases could benefit from a type of treatment like this that could preserve photoreceptors, including potentially um, um, other uh, diseases that um, have other neurons, for instance, in the inner retina, loss of ganglion cells, like can happen in um, diabetic retinopathy or in optic nerve problems like glaucoma, et cetera. So those are all things that are being uh, planned for. And I'd like to thank everybody 
who contributed to this presentation, including the people in the lab and uh, at the company, and of course, all the clinicians working hard on the clinical trials. So thank you, everybody. And I guess uh, we can entertain questions. That's perfect. Thank, thank you, Dr. Clausen. Okay, so right now, um, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to submit them in the chat for either Dr. Clausen or Dr. Liu. And right now I'm gonna allow the audience um, the chance to unmute themselves if they have any questions that they would like to say aloud. Okay. Let's see. Dr. Liu, are you yeah. still there? Perfect. Let's see. Okay, right now I don't see any questions coming in. Can I ask a question? Go right ahead, uh, Andrea. Regarding the macular degeneration, age-related, uh, you had a slide regarding vitamins. Is there any specific brand of vitamins that works better than another, or are they all pretty much the same? Because I've seen where different retinal specialists will say, oh, we like this one, and then another one will say, no, I prefer the other one, or are they pretty much all the same? <laughs> Very good question, because all the patients ask the same question. They're pretty much all the same. They have very similar content. Depends on which vitamin company you buy it from. And actually, a lot of vitamin company uh, reach out to all the retina specialists. They say, okay, I can just name it for you with a different name. Actually, the stuff is exactly the same. So I can tell you they're pretty much the same if you buy from the reputable um, manufacturer. Uh, I noticed there, you know, things like that, lut lutein and the zayat. Mm -hmm. How do you pronounce it? Lutein? Lutein, yeah. And the zeaxithin. Mm -hmm. uh, if I've compared a couple of them, and it seems like there are different degrees of uh, dosages. Uh, is there any particular dosage on those two, which seem to be the main ones that are is necessary? For the lutein, you have five to 10 milligram, that's good enough, because you do take lutein in your food uh, sources too. So like any supplement morning, like a 10 milligrams a morning enough. So we don't need more than that. And how about how about it's the other like 20 milligrams or so, that's, that's more than enough. Uh, and the, what, I'm sorry, would you just say on the Zeath? I think it's about like a 20 milligram, that should be good enough too. On the Zeath, listen, and like, how do you pronounce that? Zeoxanthin. The Zeoxanthin is 20 milligrams, you say? Mm -hmm. Now, um, what about this um, omega-3 supplement? Okay, omega-3 supplement in the uh, ARES study too, it did not show any benef uh, <laughs> beneficial uh, effects to the macular degeneration. However, it is beneficial to your eyes. It's good for your um, eyelids, it's good for your uh, tear film. So your tear film is more healthy and it's good for your heart. Mm. So it's not really necessarily good for the macular degeneration per se, but it's good for the overall health of your body. Um, can you comment on vitro macular degeneration? VMT. A uh, VMT. Okay. So VMT is a different from a visual macular adhesion. So we all have a little adhesion. What happened is the eyeball is full of uh, gels, vitreous. We call vitreous. As we were babies, those gels are solid, transparent gels. But as we get older, you know, the gel starts to contract. Why? That's because the gel is made of about 90% water, 10% hyaluronic acid, like, you know, collagen fiber, that kind of proteins. So we lose, as our skin, just like our skin, we lose collagen fibers, hyaluronic acids. So the vitreous gel start to contract. As they contract, they will start to peel away from the surface of the retina. So if they're still adhering to the retina, they have a little interface, we call vitreous macular adhesion. But when they're causing the traction, they're pulling away, causing a thickening of the retina, then we call uh, vitreous macular tr traction. So traction, that means there's some pulling on the, uh, on the macula, causing some swelling in the central macula region. Now, does that, uh, can that eventually go away or do you always need to uh, have surgery? 
It can go away, depends on the patient. Because we usually, initially, a patient is not symptomatic, vision is pretty good, we observe, because a lot of time they can pop off. But if they don't, and the macula is very thickened, causing the dec uh, decreased vision or distortion, we, re we recommend surgery. And that type of surgery is pretty easy. It's like 15 minutes, pretty quick, oh. Low, lower risk. Okay, thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you, Dr. Uh, we have, um, I think it's, I don't know if it's pronounced Rena or Rena? Rena, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very helpful and useful. And I just have a question. When you just um, uh, perform test, eye test, is it necessary to use fluorescent angiogram or it just it's just, uh, can, can, can it be skipped or how safe is it? is just fa oh the fluorescent angiogram okay yes. so we don't do fluorescent angiogram as much compared to what we used to because the development of all the new technology the octs so we can see the fluid very well on the oct that's a lot more less invasive but fluorescent angiogram overall is very very safe we will say anaphylactic reaction is one in a million and then patient tolerate very well because it's a vegetable dye. It doesn't really hurt your kidney. Patient with a kidney disease still can tolerate forcing angiogram. So how often you just, uh, can it be used? For example, every six months or once a year or something? Yes. You, usually we do a baseline uh, fluorescing angiogram with the first diagnose. And then over uh, later on, depends on the disease, we do maybe like once a year annually or once every six months. But usually no more than once every six months nowadays. Oh, so it That's usually no side effects, right? it doesn't yeah. just... No, no. Because oh. we have, you know, better technology now. We, ha we can also have another OCT because OCT angiogram, we can assess the vessels too. Oh, OCT. Oh, yes. Okay. OCT okay. angiogram. Thank you very much. You are very welcome. I okay, think we have another question from Lori that asks, how far away are we from stem cell trials for what, a for what AMD? For what AMD? Interesting. Um, you know, I think that is an interesting topic because um, first on the list, everybody thinks of dry AMD to try and preserve photoreceptors that are being lost due to geographic atrophy for which there's no lucentis or so on. So people frequently say, well, you know, there's no point in using stem cells in wet AMD because we already have a treatment. But as a lot of patients know, um, eventually, even if the um, treatment is effective for stopping the blood vessels, over time, in some people, um, the, the disease can convert basically from a wet, which is stopped by the treatment, but then it kind of converts to dry form. The point being that it continues to degenerate. So in that kind of setting, at least, um, I think that these cells could have a benefit potentially. Anyway, that's how I like to think about it. So I'm, I'm kind of positive towards the idea of uh, using these cells in wet AMD when people have already received a full course of uh, of the uh, Lucentis. Now, another thought is that it might be in the future, if that proves beneficial or safe, maybe people could be treated simultaneously. <laughs> um, and maybe in that way they don't lose, maybe they never progress um, to loss of photoreceptors. Again, I'm just speculating that these are the kinds of things I like to think. All right, we have- And also, I think, you know, the stem cell treatment will be better than those compl complement treatment because stem cells and injections are only once a year. All those complement studies, they inject monthly. Yeah, we definitely have a big benefit in terms of the staying power of the treatment. Okay, all right. We have one more for Dr. Clausen. Um, were, were the improvements in the RP studies clinically significant as well as statistically significant? Um, you know, clinically <laughs> significant, that's a vague term, I guess, unless Stephanie wants to correct me. But uh, I mean, the, the, both the, the providers and the patients in general as a population felt there was treatment benefit. 
Um, but statistical significance is really the gold standard for these things. And so what I mentioned is I showed you those two slides because the initial trial fell short of statistical significance and the retrospective analysis um, very easily hit um, statistical significance. So um, take your pick. Uh, <laughs> um, it either did or it didn't, depending how you look at it. Um, but the point is that we learned how to design the study to hit statistical significance going forward. OK. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can eye injections cause a, a vitreous gel that is contracting to create a macular hole? Generally, no. Any type of injection does cause contraction of the vitreous gel, but macular hole is very different because usually you will see those, those patients, the consistency of the vitreous is different from normal people. So uh, if they ha had a macular hole after the injection, it's because the vitreous consistency is not because of the injection. So injection doesn't really cause it. Okay, I think you replied to the question about the vitamin. Yes. And then there was another one. Um, this one's a little bit of a longer question. My retina doctor is treating my macular degeneration with injections of avatazin. Avastin, uh -huh. I, I have wet macular in my right eye for about three years. Now my doctor wants to do a laser procedure to improve the area. Are there serious side effects with this procedure, doctor has tried other injectable medications. Okay, I would assume the laser procedure they talk about is the PDT, the photodynamic therapy. So usually we tr use that if the patient's not responding to any injections and then they still have a progressive disease. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, PDT does cause geographic atrophy sometimes. I mean, it will eventually, so uh, we try not to use it. But if the patient, um, for example, like uh, the bleeding, swelling is not controlled, vision start to going down, maybe it can be used as a last resort. Okay, and I think that's going to be our last question, and it's a, we're just a few seconds shy of eight o'clock exactly. So if anyone has any other questions, um, they're welcome to email us, and then we'll just forward those over as appropriate. Can you repost that uh, email address that you had about uh, listening to this again or seeing seeing it again? Um, I'm sending that in the chat right now. So, if but if anyone has a pen and paper, it is g h e i at u c i dot e d u. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thank you, Dr. Clausen and Dr. Lou, for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. It was very Bye. interesting. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone.